What's up, guys? Happy Monday. So, start of season seven, right? Super exciting. It's just me. I'm, I'm all alone. Uh, so, no Brett tonight, but that's all right. I'll be doing my best to try to provide coverage for you guys for the five rounds and the start of season seven of Modern Magic Mondays. We've been doing this now for two years. This February which is February now, was the start of our two years. I guess in 2016, we were like, yeah! Right after the holidays, we decided that we would start recording matches up at our local shop and battling it out and recording it up and posting it up on the internet. And so for two years now, we've been been doing it. And we've had, you know, you can see scrolling across the top, our previous season champions. We just got to watch the rerun of the Season 6 Grand Finals there. Uh, of course, if you want to be able to check out any of the old VODs from any of the previous seasons, those are, of course, up on YouTube uh, for you guys to be able to enjoy. But you can see Season um, 1, Jeremy Miller, and Season 2, Lyle, Season 3, Chris, Season 4 was TJ, Season 5 was Mox or John, and then Season 6, we had our first repeat champion, which was, of course, Lyle. So, uh, super exciting to see that happen. Um, We've got five rounds to start out Season 7. Um, should be pretty exciting to see because we, we tried to bounce around to show as many different players as possible uh, to be able to show as many decks as possible um, so you guys can kind of get an idea. Um, I know the Pro Tour happened over the weekend, so there's lots to talk about for Modern for that. I'm sure a lot of people are you know, interested in... I, I'm interested in hearing what people's opinions are on how the Modern meta is and stuff like that. I personally love it. I think it's great. I'm happy with the decks that uh, did well. Like even looking at the top eight, uh, <laughs> Lantern. Even even with the top eight, like we had um, seven unique decks in the top eight. Um, of course, five color um, humans was represented twice. <laughs> yeah, Lantern one got first, which is awesome. Um, meta is fine. I think. The, um, that the lantern is a very difficult deck, right? Um, and it's not easy to pilot. It's not, um, especially if you watched uh, over the weekend, right? If you watched any of of the lantern matches that showed up on camera and stuff like that, it was really interesting to see who clearly knew the deck uh, and who didn't. Like Luis, there, um how well he piloted and, and his lines that he got to see was great uh, to be able to experience what a really good Lantern player looks like. And and I think a lot of people get used to that of maybe they're playing against Lantern players that aren't as familiar with the deck. Um, and so they're like, uh, or they just hate the concept of being locked out of the game. But I, I would be really interested to see what people's opinion is. Is it more frustrating to play against Lantern Control or play against like Tron, or play against Storm. Like what? Like those feel like the three most frustrating decks to play against in modern. I'm just curious what people think is the most frustrating. But we'll talk more about it um, throughout the night. There's going to be a podcast that's going to be recorded up on Thursday, uh, which go into more details about um, the Pro Tour and breakdowns of decks and stuff like that. So you guys will have to keep your eyes peeled. Um, not sure if it's going to be live recorded or not yet still working out the details for sure it'll be up by this weekend so you guys can at least enjoy it then and that's of course the in response to podcast which if you're on twitch scrolling down below that will give you links um, directly over to that on soundcloud it's also on itunes you can subscribe there um so you guys can check it out and then we've been posting them up on youtube as well uh for that so you know all that sort of fun uh stuff to be able to enjoy so i'm gonna hop over start round one and we'll, we can just kind of talk more uh as the rounds are going because Sadly, round one, we get to watch uh, this this scrub on camera. It's going to be difficult to try to have a uh, an unbiased cast as if I'm not casting myself. <laughs> um, so Andrew Burns, one of our newer players to the shop, um, I want to say he did not get to compete at the end of season six. Right, but he has joined in in that kind of off season as we got ready. Like, cause we 
did the end of season six right around the holidays and we had that long buffer break. Um, so now we're jumping into season seven. I'm pretty sure this is his first time being on camera. He's played with a couple different decks. Um, apparently I can't spell traverse. Um, so let me fix that. See, this is, this is why we need Brett here to help, uh, keep me on track with how to spell things. <laughs> Traverse Shadow. Um, I, I'm not sure if he's on four or five color. I can't remember, but I do remember he is more focused on um, Delirium and stuff like that. And it was very similar to a lot of the Traverse builds that were running around the Pro Tour. Um, so I figured I'd just put up Traverse Shadow for people to know. Dead Man's Chest is a new card. And of course, if there is any cards that we're talking about tonight that you don't know, we have a handy dandy card bot. So you just do exclamation card and whatever the card's name. You don't have to spell it right, just get kind of close. So Dead Man's Chest, uh, it's this enchantment, one in a black. And of course, uh, enchanted creature, you enchant a creature an opponent controls. When that creature dies, exile cards equal to its power from the top of its owner's library. You can cast non-land cards from among them as a though, uh, or uh, for, for any mana, doesn't matter, but it, as long as they remain exile. Um, so it's pretty fun, you basically can throw it on a big creature and, and have fun. Uh, so it's just a red-black removal base deck with Dead Man's Chest and just kind of manipulation. Uh, Homebrew wanted to try something a little bit different um, going forward because I decided, you know what, not used to doing my own homebrews. A lot of time I've been picking up stuff and, and basing it off of a list that I find and tweak it slightly. This is, it's been a while since I've done like a full-on homebrew. Um, so I decided when that uh, card was announced, I was like, man, I love playing cards from my opponent's deck. I love exiling stuff from their deck. Um, so this seems like a great addition because it can essentially give me an extra hand to manipulate, right? Like I have my hand, then I've got those exile cards that I can be able to mess with. So, so I definitely like it. Um, I like being able to manipulate things in, in that regard. Um, yeah, I think that's, you know, a good breakdown of what the deck can do, right? Um, so Traverse Shadow is just like any other style of Death Shadow in a way, is that you're hoping to get your life down low, um, and then you can throw down a Death Shadow and, and be able to win that way. But because it is that Traverse Shadow, Delirium is important, uh, Grim Flayers, Tarmogoyf, things like that do matter. So we'll have to see what sort of... Um, colors, I don't quite remember exactly um, on Andrew's list of what exactly how many he was at. So we'll have to find out um, soon enough, though. So getting things going, players shuffling up, getting ready to go. Yeah, Andrew was on some other lists previously and then opted to go for the Traverse Shadow. I know he's been trying out a couple different lists. I'm trying to remember what he was on previously. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head now. All right, get that. Uh Scry, resolve, decide whether to keep mulligan, all that kind of good stuff now. So what's nice with Death Shadow, um, whether it's the Grixis or the Traverse style, you, you have a nice mix of 
disruption and removal cards set up in your list to kind of help help you set up where you want to go with the game. Um, and in this sort of early situation, it's going to be a lot of this trading resources back and forth of, you know, let me look at your hand, let me kill a creature that's on the battlefield, things like that. And that looks like a godless shrine expedition. So he'll drop down to 18. Bloodstained Mire and pass. So it's just sort of a normal setup, like you have a shock land, let's do it. Alright, Andrew's going to drop down to 16 with a Thought Seize. And so I kind of lay things out. Um, Dead Man's Chest is that new card that's, of course, text is in the chat that we had talked about. Um, that I exile or enchanted onto a creature my opponent's control and kind of can manipulate their deck when that creature dies. Got two lightning bolts. Um, and then, of course, our, our pretty sweet two drop here um, two, three, lifelink, death touch. Just kind of like an early threat. The life gain is relevant. Uh, and Death Touch can be relevant too. If I put this on a big creature, then maybe they won't, like the Dead Man's Chest on a big creature, maybe they won't want to attack. So that is an, a nice little kind of delay factor. And that. Yeah, so Smart Pick goes right for that Dead Man's Chest and not even going to worry about it. Andrew's going to write things down. Um just to kind of keep track of things a little bit better so he knows. And I recommend that for all players, uh, especially if you're, I mean, if you're having a casual game and stuff like that just for fun, you know, people will sit there and play with their hands revealed. And even at, at like, the local shop, we'll have that from time to time. That's great. But I know if you're going to be practicing and trying to improve, um, the more that you can get yourself into those habits, um, the better it is. And I'll drop down to 19. Fetching up that Blood Crypt. So getting the threat out. Um, again, this can pull removal spells, that sort of thing. Sinister Minister, thank you for the follow. And this is going to be the, the biggest struggle is if we get new followers tonight, normally Brett does it because my ability <laughs> to pronounce a lot of usernames uh, sucks. So <laughs> I'm going to do my best to try to bubble my way through it. But thanks so much for the follow. Glad you're liking the stream tonight. There's our basic forest coming out. And here's our old goif. Luckily, we have the Tarmadife dice available to us so we can know exactly how big he is and yeah he's uh four or five just do confirmation check instant sorcery land creature you know what where are we at here um so another land basic swamp yeah, the Dead Man's Chest list is kind of like if you're playing a more control -y style of strategy. It's, you know, controlling what is on the board kind of thing. Um, with only one red source, I can't go like this double bolt stuff. I have to kind of rely on other stuff. Uh, opted not to attack there. Um, to try to have a blocker. Um, Could have kind of forced the issue um, kind of thing, made him have a removal spell there because the likelihood he'll trade off is slim. I'm already at 19 life, so I figure, hey, if I can get a block out, sweet. If not, probably should have pushed for damage, but I also, if, you know, you have to be careful when you're playing against the Death Shadow of how much extra damage you do initially, like if it's just little little low shots like that. So Andrew's going to fetch again, least dropping to 15, could be dropping 
on down to 13. And looks like he will be. And so he, he is sitting on a four color list uh, for the Traverse. There is no blue. Um, really, if you're going to be wanting to play blue, if you're going to be doing Death Shadow, uh, it is more of that Grixis list. So he doesn't access to green, black, you know, the normal kind of colors we'd expect to see, then red and white as his other two colors. Now it's that debate, you know, which spell is best. Second Goy is going to come down. Again, both are four fives. And passes. So I, I get essentially a free chance to get away with it. Uh, and I drew another swamp. So sitting with two swamps and two bolts in my hand. So deck not cooperating the way that uh, would like. That's all right. We still have a potential to kind of block things. Tilly pushes it, gets it out of the way, and now there's going to be, you know, um, ten points of damage coming out here uh, because that is the first creature. Uh, because of course there is there was enchantment land instant sorcery now that creature as the last type puts it up to a five six and you know i'm sitting with a lot of cards in hand right now i've got a lot of mana untap it is a little scary um but no way to kind of deal with that and drop down to nine immediately off that one attack And there's the Traverse. He does have Delirium. So he can find a creature if he would like. So we'll search up. I um, believe he does find a Death Shadow there. The makes the most sense, I guess, is like a follow-up just in case things don't go well with this double goif plan does have that sort of backup plan available to him but i'm pretty much dead to rights unless i you know top deck a damnation or something crazy like that or anything out of the out of the norm that might uh, pop up here uh grim flare a little bit stronger because the whole delirium Black and a green, 2-2, two, two, trample. Whenever he deals combat damage to the player, you get to look at the top three. Um, and, of course, you can put uh, any of those cards in your graveyard, the rest back on top. And you get to plus two, plus two, as long as there are four more cards in your graveyard. Now, he's going to throw an Inquisition, uh, get rid of one of my bolts. Um, I could have shot a bolt and lost a bolt kind of thing, but, eh, he's at 13. It wasn't really going to get there there. So... Game one, the power of the Goyf is too much. Um, so, But now I can uh, do some adjustments. And you see I'm immediately adding in a lot more creatures. Uh, that was one of the things that I noticed um, initially playing the list. There wasn't as many threats main board in every single game two. Uh, I would always go right for adding in more creatures. Um so that was that's a nice thing to, to be able to do once you start testing with a deck is see where its strengths and weaknesses are. And so that again, this is the first time playing uh, with a list and, and being able to do some adjustments to things and going through and deciding, okay, how many of these do I need? What what'll help me? Um, I start shaving on the bolts um, as one of the things because I a lot of his creatures are going to be a 
above bolt range. He's not going to tend to usually be low enough uh, in life for me to just be like, all right, bolt killed you. It's possible because it is Death Shadow. They can get pretty low. But I decided to rely more on uh, removal and creatures this time. Um, Andrew not really able to see much. Like, he got to see a little bit of what I was doing with based on stripping cards from my hand, but, you know, that was a very sort of, here's a lot of lands, not a lot of action, uh, which works out great if you're on that traverse plan, and you're just like, okay, you mean I just get to do whatever I want, and you're not going to mess with me any? Cool, that's, that, yeah, that seems awesome, let's do that. Um, so... <laughs> There's the chat window, says Sinister Mister. <laughs> okay, so four color with white splash is what is the official rundown of what it was. Which makes a lot of sense. The white I I I like the white splash available because of the uh, cards that can be available in the sideboard. Um, you know, it, it makes for some great additions that you can be able uh, to add into it. Um, like Lingering Souls, I, I'm a big fan of, um, if that is an option to go for. Um, I, I know there's some of the Traverse lists that were running around um, for the uh, the Pro Tour um, were kind of the four-color list. Um, and even five color lists, if you will, like they would have a godless shrine in their sideboards from time to time and just try out something, um, something a little different, you know? Um, but again, it's kind of where you're at. I think, you know, there's sweet cards with white, like Ranger of Eos, uh, is a nice one. So you can find a bunch of death shadows, um, you know, there's some there's some cool stuff that you can do with the other Death Shadows um, list. So, I think Traverse was more popular than Grixis was for the Pro Tour, and there were so many different ways for players to build Traverse that it really added a lot of fun and flexibility to people's lists. Um, like some people were, were running that, that Gore Clan Rampager in their list. Um, some people had some cool sideboard stuff like Team or Battle Rage and like there's what's cool is there are that kind of flexibility to it. Ah, okay. So, um, since they're talking about how he ran the five color list the week before this, but Stubborn Nile and Teamer Battle Rage are basically accomplishing the same things. Um, and with the four color list, it lets you play um, without a land in the sideboard, and you get a basic. Uh, main board, which can be much more beneficial based on the meta that we have with Blood Moons running around. So, basic swamp into a Thought Seize, and look at that hand. Double Street Wraith, Fatal Push, and um, I keep wanting to call it Dread Boar. Um, not Dread Boar. Uh, Terminate. Wow. Man, my brain is, is mush today, guys. The, the benefits of having that co-caster there to help you when your brain uh, is turned to mush. So let's see what Andrew uh, is able to draw off of it. Cycles a Street Wraith. Drops down to 18. So sitting 18 all now. question is go for like the double cycle now it really depends on what he's drawing what he's trying to accomplish with his first couple of hands right maybe digging for that kind of um ability to 
disrupt my hand. Some Inquisition, some sort of Thoughtseize effect. And Blood Crypt drops Andrew to 16. Play this race game. I'll drop down to 15. Um, and, you know, it could be that sort of scary thing, too, is, like, not really familiar with what my list is trying to do since it is more of a homebrew. So it's like, what exactly am I facing? And knowing that he's got the Fatal Pushes, this is also a way to kind of draw out those removal spells. Um, less removal spells in his hand means that the creatures that I care more about later on are going to stick. Andrew in the tank, kind of in that decision-making spot of should I, you know, do this whole shock thing again? Do I need to cycle here? But uh, we'll drop down to 14 with that overgrown tomb. And there's the push to just get rid of my guy off the battlefield. Not going to deal with him. God, the shrine's going to come down, basically giving Andrew access to all the colors that he might want. And there's a lily. So we'll opt for that uptick, forcing us to discard a card, and he says, no problem, I'll discard a land. Um, and then that puts me at that, what removal spell should I get rid of here? And the Terminate is what I get rid of. Sitting with a Terminate, Fatal Push, Cold Guns Command in hand. We'll drop down as well to 14. So landing a Planeswalker here is really key because you do get to start disrupting hands. And if I, I do land a creature uh, and me forcing the removal spells to come out, it now sets me up into a position where, okay, if I land a creature, he just negs two on Lily and is in a great spot. So, like, Liliana on an empty board is a huge control shift now for Andrew. Like, before, it's just this sort of, okay, let's look at each other's hands, let's do this sort of back-and-forth thing, maybe kill a creature here, maybe kill a creature there, but now that there's no creatures, Lily's around, and things are going to get scary. And simple uptick. Like, there's no point in a neg twoing on Lily when there's no creatures to have to sack. So, response to this Colgan's command return a creature. I think I have Andrew discard here. Uh, I could have done two to Lily, but I think Andrew was sitting at like three or four cards. So, by doing this, it helps decrease the amount of cards in his hand overall. Maybe I'll get rid of some more removal for when I have a creature that I want to keep. 
So now we're both sitting at two cards in hand. After he's forced to pitch away, it looks like two removal spells there. Time for another Traverse. Delirium, I believe, is good. We'll find a mystery card. I don't remember what it was. So this time my deck's having the opposite um, problem that game one had. Game one I had all the lands, this time I'm stuck on three lands and keep missing land drops. And there's a push, gets rid of that. Again, Lily's no longer threatened, she can keep upticking if she wanted to. I'm at two cards in hand, Andrew after drawing will be at two cards in hand. So Lily of course does affect both players, both players do have to discard. Sinister saying, I don't, uh, also wondering why I discarded so much removal. Um, and I guess it's like, I I'm, I'm don't have many threats out, so no point in keeping as much removal if there's not really that many threats. And now things can get scary, right? So, Goif does come out. We double check what cards we have in each other's graveyards. Okay, where are we at? You know, instant source for a creature land cool the normal stuff uptick what do i end up losing slaughter pack goes again i think i just drew slaughter pack last time uh would have which would have been a cool one to be able to use um but so this is basically saying hey you're gonna have to neg two so i get to keep that one card that's hidden in my hand Unless you draw a removal spell, then I lose it anyway, so might as well try. Still going to be able to, uh, still going to take four, and a land makes it nice that I don't have to worry about eating a removal spell. Um, and Lily upticks instead, and Gonti is discarded. So looks like will not opt for that. Uh, attack there not going for that sack swing it for four which you know I'm sitting at one card what's that last card by upticking I can guarantee take that card away and you're sitting there with the chance to be able to ultimate Lily and still keep her alive to basically divide up what I have and really keep me off of lands So, get some lifelink in there, go back to 16, Andrew drops down to 10, and that's, you know, instead of going for Lily, there's no point, he's already got it up enough that if he wanted to, he can make me sack all this stuff. Um, doing more damage to Andrew's nice. The, the problem with it is I took out all those bolts, so even though I'm getting him down low, it's going to take a lot more to finish it off. And there's the sack making me lose my creature. Four damage is going to come across. Drops me to 12. And just going to fetch. Down to 9. And I opt to... Uh, knowing that he's already used Lily's ability... 
Um, I'm going to say, okay, in response to your fetch, I'm going to do Colgan's command, make you discard that one card that you're holding on to, and I'm going to return Gonti um, to my hand. In case that is like a creature or something like that that I can, you know, stop him from being able to use. Maybe it's a um, Inquisitioners or something or a removal spell he was holding on to. And really, I just need a land to play Gonti. And again, if we had that advantage meter, the advantage meter is way on Andrew's side right now. Like, he's got control of the board with a Goyf and a Liliana. Any creature that I play immediately is going to be sacrificed. Um, cards that I have in my hand can immediately start getting discarded. And that's where Andrew's at now is like, okay, do I not tick up Liliana if I want to be able to keep my spell like if it's a removal spell then i might want to keep this but if it's not you know do i hold it is it worth it or not and there's this sort of back and forth now that lily uh is doing this whole battle when andrew's behind but he goes yep all right i'll discard and i discard a thought seize to keep gonti in there and there's four more coming at me this drops me down to eight still digging for that land and that's the land I get not the one I was hoping for because then I have to drop down to six and I get to use Gonti and for those that aren't familiar because it is kind of a standard card um, Gonti Lord of Luxury see so again you just kind of get close um, and Cardbot will help you with it. So Gonti Lord of Luxury, you see there's a lot of text on it. Uh, four costs for two, three death touch. When he enters the battlefield, look at the top four cards of target opponent's library. You get to exile one of them face down. Then put the rest on the bottom of that player's library in random order. You can look at that card and cast that card for as long as you're exiled. And you can spend mana as though it was many mana of any type to cast that spell so just a nice little thing and so i able to steal at least one card off it you see i just kind of tuck it underneath gonti there even if gonti leaves that card it stays exiled and i can still use it but now i have no cards left in hand so it's it's basically saying okay sack that swing for four puts you to two right hope for the best And hope that he doesn't have a lightning bolt here, right? And I just sort of slide that aside. And still use it at some point. Hoping for one of my many removal spells to come up. Terminates. Fatal pushes. Anything. And there's the lands. All those lands we were missing, guys. They're showing up. Perfect timing. Here comes the Goyf, and because you were nice enough to give me that fatal push, I will destroy your Goyf with it. Of course, that was the card that I did exile off of Gonti, and one of the reasons I run it in here is because I just like to manipulate my opponent's library. That's the whole idea behind Dead Man's Chest, and there is a Death Shadow. Oh, I missed two points of life, I guess. So he's at seven. All right. If it's a six, six right now. And there's a damnation off the top, which is nice. Gets any threats off the battlefield. Again, still kind of in this mindset. No lightning bolts, no lightning bolts, no lightning bolts. All right. Do not give me any lightning bolts. 
And we'll see Lily uptick here. So what's going on here? Andrew has his graveyard organized to help keep him a little bit on track for his um, traverse and stuff like that. How his deliriums and he's got the sorceries, instants, you know, creatures, lands, stuff like that. So. And there's a fatal push that I have to discard. Inquisition. Uh, four mana. Pia and Kira. So now, even if he makes me sack a creature, I still have some threats available. And I can swing in next turn and start flinging the Thopters at Andrew. So starting to come back, starting to stabilize essentially at this point in time. Again, still on that no lightning bolt or bust. And there's the tar fire for the last two points of damage to get me. So, again, tar fire is a really good one to run in uh, particular um, delirium based strategies. Like, it's a tribal instant, um, so it does boost up goif, right? Uh, a little bit more also helps you with that whole delirium thing because it's tribal based which is you know cool that it has that little extra in there so it's not often that you get to see me on camera um try to let some of the other players on but i figured hey andrew has not been on camera yet we have the option to let him on camera round one let's do that and i got to show off kind of a new deck a little bit uh sadly my deck didn't do as well as i wanted round one but it did it performed much better the rest of the rounds, which happens from time to time. Gets gets the kinks worked out of it, if you will, is just more shuffling. Uh, but Andrew played really well uh, with his lines of play that he had there. And you got to see it was kind of that control stuff going on. Um, you know, being able to have this, all right, I've got a Lily now, I've got a Goyf, and we're doing this sort of battle back and forth of, you know, can I control the battlefield with creatures? Both of us are kind of flinging removal spells. Both of us have that disruption for the hand. But really, be because the board was clear, that Lily hit, and it made such a difference uh, for that that last game there. Uh, but really good games uh, out of Andrew there. So uh, exciting way to start Season 7, guys. You know, Great way to, to jump into things. So again, we've got five rounds tonight. We're going to just kind of slide over to round two and kind of get things going. While the matches are on, feel free to ask stuff in chat. Let us know what you guys are thinking about the games. If you guys watched the Pro Tour over the weekend, let us know about that. And let me do a quick reset here. Bam, bam.